Last week, we completed the book of Exodus. We spent a year and a half in the book of Exodus. Amen. Do I hear an amen? Guys, listen. It's important, man, to go through the Bible. It's important to study through the Word. And it's just as important when we finish a book that we celebrate that. And because, at least for us, for Denver Calvary and for Calvary Chapel churches, it's our goal as a church to study the entire Bible. To where we can say we've, we've studied every book, every chapter, every verse that we've studied and read through it. That's our goal. And just like when the Paul the Apostle, you might recall, in Acts chapter 20, when Paul was in Miletus with the elders there, or in Ephesus, I should say, and he was talking to them, ready to go to Jerusalem to be arrested. He knew that was going to happen. He says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God's word. And I would love to one day, and us as a church one day would say, we have gone as a church through the whole Bible together. Wouldn't that be cool? That's the goal. That Pastor Chuck did it a bunch of times. He went through a couple times, a few times, all the way through. And so that's our goal. Now, we're going to pause by going through a book. And what we're going to do, we're going to do something a little bit different, something important. And that is for us to focus on some key areas as a church. And so over the next several weeks, six or seven weeks, we're going to spend time over this series that we've entitled Servant Leadership. Servant Leadership. Now, the reason for this uh, again, I'll share some of the intent and reason, but or originally the idea was for us to do a servant class for our leadership of our church and the people who currently serve, to kind of narrow down just for them. And after some time in prayer back in the spring, I really felt, in the, in the summer, I really felt the Lord calling our church to do this together. So what you're going to encounter over the next several weeks is basically like a class in your mind that's going to focus on the topic and the subject of servant leadership. Now, right off the bat, you might say, okay, pastor, that's great, but I am not a leader, and I am not aspiring to be a leader, and, and I think there's some clarity that needs to be redefined in your mind when you think of servant leadership. So when I say that, and I, and I ask that question, what do I mean by servant leadership? I want to give a picture of what the Bible describes as servant leadership for you and me, okay? So that's what I want to do. So by way of definition, servant leadership is this. It is a non-traditional leadership philosophy. Servant leadership embeds itself in behaviors and practices that places the primary emphasis on the well-being of others. That is what servant leadership is. You know, oftentimes when we think of leadership or people that aspire to be leaders, they have a misconception of what that means. In fact, oftentimes when we think of a, a leadership role, the idea comes that we might, you know, lord over other people or the idea of aspiring for glory or power or position or honor. Nothing could be said further from the truth than the idea of aspiring to be a Christian that lives their life under this idea and thought of being a servant leadership. Again, the goal for a Christian isn't to receive the glory, right? The goal for the Christian and the Christian servant and a Christian leader is to point people to the one who has the glory, and that's the Lord. That's our aim. That's our focus. Now again, you might say this morning, well, Pastor Louis, I am no leader, and I don't have any aspirations to be a leader. But is that true? That idea and thought. Because what's it mean to be a leader? What does that mean for us? Again, oftentimes when we think of a leader, we think of someone that has the role and responsibility of a leader that guides people, right? And I think that's true. Leads people, I think that's true. But I would argue this morning that every Christian has a biblical responsibility to lead. To lead people to Christ, to lead people to truth. I'll put it this way, and, and you, this is a response time, right? So this is time for you to interact with me, all right? Here we go. How many of you in the room are married? Raise up your hand. Doesn't need to be quick, you can raise up your hand. All right, quite a, good, quite a bit of people. How many of you in the, in the room are a parent? Raise up your hand. Okay, a little bit more hands. How many in the room are a grandparent? Raise up your hand. Okay, now, this is a big one. How many of you are a Christian. Raise up your hand. Yeah. 
A lot more people, right? So here's the idea. If you raised up your hand in any of those questions, you are called today by God to be a servant leader in the church. You are called to be a servant and leader for Christ. We are called to live the gospel. We are called to lead people to Jesus. This is the aim of the Christian's life, to live this, reflect this, and do this with our words, with our disposition, with our attitudes, with our conduct. So what's it mean to be a servant leader? Well, about, gosh, many, many moons ago, when I first was a Christian, I remember going on my very first missionary a trip um, as a Christian. I was about 17. And I believe I saw this picture then at that point in time. But there was, we were going through some ministry training, and I was like learning about what this means to be a Christian. And they used this picture to, to illustrate what that is. And so we'll put it up on here. Look at this picture with me. This is a great picture of what it means to be a servant leader. Do we have that picture? Did I send that to you, James? I did. Boom, there it is. How many of you guys have ever seen that picture? It's pretty popular. Nope, only, only a few people. Okay, good. You're seeing for this for the first time. You've seen it before? You kind of? Okay, maybe in minute in training. Uh, this picture has been used many times. But here's what you find. You'll notice a couple things. One, you'll notice someone, instead of leading, they're just bossing. Instead of leading, they're being a boss. They're telling others where to go while they themselves are being carried on their backs. That is not a leader, that's a boss. But there's an image down below that carries a greater weight. We see that a leader points on the direction we need to go. But that leader also hel helps carry the burden while he directs people where to go. This is the idea. We have the gospel. And we can tell people, you need to go become a Christian. You need to get saved or you're going to hell. Right? We can, we can approach people that way. Or we can say, listen, you need Jesus in your life. I need Jesus in life. I want to show you my life by my example, by leading you to Jesus. Again, this is a great example of what it means to be a servant leader. Pointing people in the right direction, but living that out in our lives. And showing them where to go. And so the purpose of the next several weeks has a, a number of reasons, and we'll uncover those reasons as we go, but here are a few. The first is that we want to teach people how to serve. It's very, very important you to learn to serve. Jesus is the role model for that. But the second is that God also wants to raise up servant leaders to help lead the church. It's very important. And lastly, that you would understand a little bit more about this church, about Denver Calvary, about Calvary Chapel in general, to have an understanding of the ministry and philosophy and approach that we take to ministry in our church. So we're going to spend some time in this series talking about these things, laying a foundation, and, and plugging forward in this. Now, let me just preference this before we go into, in, into our time of actual study. This is kind of a, a foundation, if you will. But I have been in Calvary Chapel pretty much my whole life, I've been in full-time ministry for about 26 years, been serving for about 30 of those years in ministry, both my wife and I. My father-in-law is a Calvary Chapel pastor, and so I have a great foundation of philosophy of ministry. Over those 30 years, I've had great Bible teachers in my life. Pastor Jeff Johnson from Calvary Chapel Downey in California. He's, since, he's just retired. He's in his, in his uh, mid-70s. He's battling cancer. He's finding victory over cancer. So he just handed off the church. But boy, man, talk about incredible amounts of wisdom in ministry. Pastor Chuck, uh, I've had I countless times, I can't even count how many times under Pastor Chuck Smith that I've had the privilege of sitting and just listening. We're talking pastors' conferences, youth pastors' conferences, camps. We used to have, I used to have Pastor Chuck on all our camps come on out, and I would run camps within Calvary, and I would have several hundred kids, and Pastor Chuck would come out for the week, and he'd stay with us, and he would just teach. I've had the opportunity to teach with Pastor Chuck, being there. And then Moving from California to Colorado, God allowed me to serve with Pastor Ed Taylor at Calvary Church in, in Aurora. How many of you guys are familiar with Pastor Ed? Are you guys familiar with him? He's on Grace FM, great pastor, and I, I was under that church and his leadership for 10 years. And so what I am going to do 
is basically share all the things that they've shared. I'm just going to repeat the things that they've shared because those are the things that I've taught, would have been taught, have grown in. Things I've learned from Pastor Ed and Pastor Jeff and Pastor Chuck. And so these things, for some of you, aren't going to be new. In fact, if you grew up in Calvary, you can say, I've heard this before. Pastor Chuck said that. Well, guess right. He did say that. And he taught this in my life. And so I'm going to be stealing all of their messages. I'm going to be taking from the things that they've taught, they've written in their books. And these are things that I have learned that I'm now sharing with you. So I don't take credit for any of this, all right? Let me make that really clear. So let's jump into this. If you have your Bible, turn to two places today, two spots. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and put a, a, a mark, put your bulletin there, mark that. And also turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. So two places today. And we're going to start in Mark 9. And if we're taking notes, and I encourage you to take notes, I encourage you to highlight and mark your Bible, to write in your Bible. I, I mark in my, my Bible all the time. Here's, here's my Bible. This is Mark chapter 8 and 9 in my Bible. And I mark my Bible. I highlight my Bible. When I read it, when I study, I do this myself. And I encourage you to do that, to help remember and memorize Scripture. But the title of today's message is this. God is uses the ordinary. God uses the ordinary. If there's one thing I want you to get today as you leave, is that God uses the ordinary. And I hope that encourages you, because it's important to know that in the Bible, when you look at the people God has used throughout the entirety of world history, Bible history, those that were followers of God, he has always used regular and ordinary people. Guys, that should encourage you and me today. Because let me ask you this next question, and this is important that you really answer this. Do you want to be someone God could use? Do you really want to be someone that God will use? Your life, your life, where you're at right now. Maybe you're single. Do you want God to use you in your singleness? Maybe you're married. Do you want God to use you in your marriage to help other couples or other people? You as a grandparent, you guys, even in older age, you're like, oh, I'm done. I'm done with all that stuff. No, listen, even if you're older, do you want God to use you right where you're at? I hope the answer is yes. That you would say, Lord, here I am, use me. Just like the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. This is why we come to church. This is why we gather on the regular. Is to seek the word, to ask what God wants, and then to go and do it, and to live it. We come to listen. We come to grow in faith. We come to be more usable by God, for God. And it always starts right here, guys. Your usability from God's perspective starts with your willingness and your decision to follow in the steps of Jesus. Because that's where it begins. That's where discipleship 101 begins, is to follow after Jesus. And so our goal over the next several weeks is to learn and grow, making this a reality in our life, in the life of this little church here that's called Denver Calvary. And again, the messages that we have to share with you guys, they can impact your life. They can radically grow you in faith if you allow God to speak to you. If that you take steps of greater obedience and service. If you begin to give yourself to God for the sake of others. So do we need more servants in the church? Do we need more servants in the church? What's the answer? Yes, yes absolutely. Do we need more leaders in the church? What's the answer? Yes. So when I say that, guys, I'm not just talking our church. We're talking universally, the church, right? The answer is yes. And one of the things that we learn is that there's a model of ministry that God demonstrates in the life of Jesus. And that is learning to be those that serve. Serving teaches us how to grow in faith. Serving teaches us how to work through issues of life as we serve. In fact, if you talk with any of our leaders in our church, they'll show you, man. They'll tell you. That if you start serving in a greater capacity, you learn how to work through difficulties, to work with people, to handle challenges, disagreements, how to walk and serve with humility, how to grow in greater faith and service to Jesus. And again, for some of you guys today, the things that we'll learn over the next several weeks 
are just going to reinforce where you're at right now. For others, some of you, it's going to provoke you to stir you up, to begin to serve in ways maybe you've never done that before. And for some, all while, as we're studying this over the next several weeks, um, for some of you, the things that you're going to hear, you're going to be hearing for the very first time. And so here's the bottom, the bottom line truth for you today. God wants to use your life. Every one of you, as broken and messed up as you think you are today, God will use you right where you're at. In fact, for some of you guys, man, God wants to use you more than you want to be used. God's like, I'm just waiting for them to surrender. I'm just waiting for them to say yes. And God's like, he's going to scoop in and begin to work in you and through you more than you maybe even are willing to allow God to work in your life today. So let's begin. Let's look at this text on what servant leadership looks like from the eyes of God, from the life of Jesus. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 33. Look what he says here. And we're going to be in Mark 9, Mark 10 here. In verse 33, it says, Then Jesus came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked the disciples, What was it that you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent. For on the road, they disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. So here's something to understand. These guys that are hanging out with Jesus are ordinary guys. They're all from different occupations. You have a big group that are fishermen. You know, you have have Matthew who was a tax collector. You have Judas who was a zealot. You have all these guys from different backgrounds, right? And these 12 apostles and disciples. So, you know, there's probably a good 50 plus people around Jesus. And 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 as they're walking to Capernaum, Jesus' hometown, he says, man, I, I overheard you guys disputing. You guys were fighting arguing. What were you guys arguing about? Now, do you think Jesus knew what they were arguing about? What's the answer? Yes. They did too. And they were kind of embarrassed. They were kind of like, oh man, we got called out. Jesus is calling us on the carpet. And they were upset. They kept silent because they were fighting and arguing with who would be the greatest. The greatest where? In heaven, in God's kingdom. And so there you go, you got, you got, you know, Matthew over there going, well, I think I'd be the greatest because, you know, I, I, I left, I left, I left a, you know, a good job to come follow Jesus. How about you? Well, I'm a fisherman. Yeah, my, my job was paying six figures. How about yours? Well, I wasn't paying that. But I don't have any education. I'm following Jesus. I left it all. But I, I left my nets. I'm following. I think I'm going to, Peter's like, I'll be greater than you. I know that. And then you got other guys that they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And we see here that Jesus begins to teach them what ministry was really all about. What it means to serve the Lord is really all about. And he basically teaches them what it means in verse 35. And so he sat down, he called the 12, and he said to them, this is where you want to mark your Bible. If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last and the servant of all. You want to be first in the kingdom of God? You want to be the greatest in God's eyes? Then you need to change the way you think and you need to put yourself last and you need to put it on an apron and you need to start serving other people above yourself. That's crazy. He gives them the illustration that you want to, you want to be great in the economy of God? You want to make it to the highest rank in heaven? He said this, and you might have heard this before. This is a famous saying in ministry. It's described this way. Oftentimes, the way up is what? Down. You want to go up in the eyes of God. You want to be used greatly in God's eyes. You want want to reach the, the, the heights of glory in heaven. It happens by you by taking the form of a servant. Boy, that's different. Maybe you don't realize that, that in God's economy... That's greatness in the eyes of God. It's not exalting yourself, but exalting everyone above yourself. The way up is down. Look what he says next. Mark chapter 10, next chapter over, verse 42. Let's continue with the same idea, the same thought about how to become great in God's kingdom. Look what he says in verse 42. He says in verse 42, it says, But Jesus called uh, them to himself, and he said to them, 
You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, how they lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave to all. Verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Boy, Jesus gives us a stark contrast of what glory in heaven will be like. What glory of heaven, reaching the heights of it. And what Jesus does is he gives a contrast to the way the world does things versus how God does things. Notice there's a contrast. He says, notice, he says in verse 30 and 42 that the rulers in the Gentile world, how they do it. Who do you think was ruling at this time in the Gentile world? The Romans. The Romans were large and in charge, right? Caesar was in charge of the world empire at the time. Rome conquered everything. Everyone was subjected to Rome. And so he uses this empire as an illustration of how the world does things. And how does the world does, how do they do things? They lord over people. They tell people what to do. They demand that they do it. They demand that they serve them because they're the ones in charge and large and in charge. That is the approach of a, a, a Roman, Gentile, pagan world. You serve me because I'm in charge. He says that's, that's the way the world does it. Today, that happens, but not so drastically, right? In fact, you might be, have, have been taught this, right? There you are, you go to college for four years. You work hard, you get your degree, and then you jump into the corporate world whether it's finance or whether it's business or whether it's stock and trade, whether it's upper management, whatever. But the idea is the same, right? You, you didn't come in at the entry level to stay at the entry level. No, you want to climb the corporate what? Ladder. Every single person wants to do that. Why? Because we want to grow in greater position. With greater position will come, well, greater benefit. Higher pay, better benefits, responsibility, but then what you also learn in the corporate world is, man, I don't want so many, I don't want to do their job. I, I, don't want, I don't want to have to work for them. I want others to work for who? Me. Because as you climb the corporate ladder, well, guess what? There, it comes with some great benefits. But one of the things that you learn, if you haven't learned this already, is, man, going up the corporate ladder, it's cutthroat. Because as I'm climbing up, that means those that are above me have to go below me. And so as I'm climbing up, I'm kicking them down. And that's the way it is. And it's, it's cutthroat. I remember, so for, for a short time, I worked for Starbucks. I managed for them. I opened up a number of their stores. I was an MCM, a manager coaching mentor. I managed multiple stores at, at multiple times. And, and I remember we had a newer guy that we hired externally. He came from a different uh, QSR company, quick service restaurant company, and he began working for Starbucks. And he was in my store one day doing some interviews or something, and he went over my head and he talked to my district manager about something he didn't like in my store. Kind of make himself look good, make me look bad. And, and he's just basically trying to like, oh, I don't, I don't do what he's doing in his store. And it really ticked me off. I was like, and I remember I confronted him, and I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Dude, don't ever come to my store if you're going to throw me under the bus. Why? There's this idea of competition, right? Getting further ahead. And people do that to, to get gain seniority. Again, the higher you climb, the less you have to do, and the more that you have others to do the work for you. That is the way the world thinks. And if you've ever had a bad boss, it's never pleasant, is it? They don't treat you well. They don't speak to you well. They don't pay you well. They don't appreciate your hard work. And you walk away just being frustrated, going, man, I, when I get there, I'm going to do things different. But what does Jesus say? What's he say in verse 43? This is key about our approach to this idea of how we do life. He says in verse 43, that first sentence, yet it shall not be among you. Don't bring that philosophy into the church. Don't bring that kind of philosophy into your walk with the Lord. 
because we are to have a different perspective on life and on ministry. It's different. Whoever desires to be great among you shall be your servant, and whoever desires to be first shall be a slave to all. Now we look at verse 43, and he says here, whoever desires to become among you to, to, shall be your servant. That word servant is very important. You want to mark that and highlight that in your Bible. And right next to it, there in the space that you have in your Bible, you want to write the word diakonos. Diakonos. Now maybe you don't know this, but in the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament was written in, in Hebrew, the he Hebrew language, translated to English. The New Testament what, what is all originally in what language? Greek. And so it's translated into English. Well, the problem with translation is that you lose thought, idea, intent behind a specific word. And so one of the things, when you go to Bible college and you learn to study your Bible, you learn to go to the original language so you can find the original intent, what they're describing, what they're talking about. That word servant is the Greek word diakonos, is where we get the English word deacon. Anybody ever heard the word deacon before in the church? Yeah, oh, that person's a deacon. Well, they're a deacon. They're a deacon. All a deacon is, is a servant. But typically, someone who's a deacon in the church is a someone who has responsibility or a leader or, as we will describe, a servant leader. A deacon is just a servant. You might recall, you can write Acts chapter 6 next to that passage of, 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 of Mark 10, 42. In Acts chapter 6, the apostles, their ministry was growing. Thousands were getting saved. And they had a ministry helping widows with food. It's like benevolence. And so they were passing out food, clothes, things like that. And, and so they were having problems with this ministry that they started. Arguing was happening, fighting was happening. And the apostles were like, man, we can't take, we have other things that God wants us to do. And so they need to raise up servants, deacons, to help take care of this ministry. And that's Acts chapter 6. That's what they did. They found people among themselves that were full of the Spirit, wisdom, and they raised them up to serve those needs in the church. So what does Jesus teach us? He teaches us this. You want to be great in the eyes of the Lord, then you have to take the place of being a servant, a deacon. A deacon is just someone who serves. That's it. Quite literally, it's someone who is a server. They serve. They are a waiter or a waitress. Anybody here ever encounter a very good waiter or waitress? Raise your hand. Anybody? You know what they, they're like, right? We, we went out for my daughter's 16th birthday with our family um, a week ago or so. And, uh, and so we went out to this restaurant and we sat down and we had a great server. She was amazing. She came up, hey guys, how are you doing? Smiling. She attended, like, man, we're so glad you're with Have you been here before? First time? Well, let me tell you what we're known for. And she began explaining the menu. Man, I, I want, I'm going to be your server. My name is such and such. And can I get you guys some beverages? And so she got our beverages. She came by. She filled them up. Hey, what about appetizers? We have some great. And she, she was just great. And we didn't even need to call her once. Why? Because any time we began to run out, she was right there to fill up our glass. She brought out our food. It was hot. She asked if it tasted good. It tasted great. Great experience. Why? Because we had a great server. Have you ever had a bad waiter or waitress? It's annoying. You're going to this restaurant. You're shelling out the big bucks, right? And you're eating your food. And you're like, man, I'm dying of thirst. And there's like, you're like, you're sucking on the ice because they're not filling the water glass up, right? They come out and bring your food and it's cold and you can't even tell them to heat it up because they're nowhere to be found. And you're thinking, man, I have to give a tip on this? You know, 2%. No, don't do that, right? But, but you, you measure the level of service based on their, their commitment to take care of you, right? A good service, bad service. What does Jesus say for you and me to be a good server, to serve Jesus well? Well, look what he says. Again, down in verse 43 of chapter 10, what's he say? It shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be a servant of all. Verse 44, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be a slave to all. Gosh, that sounds pretty harsh. That sounds pretty difficult. I need to serve everybody. 
I need to be a slave to other people? That sounds challenging. Now, once again, you go back to the original language of which Mark was written in, which was written in Greek. That word slave is another important word. That word slave is not what you're thinking of someone who has chains around their necks or wrists or their ankles. And you're like, oh man, I'm serving Jesus today. That's not what it's describing. Maybe that's your first impressions. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Again, highlight that word save or slave, mark it, highlight it, underline it. And next to the indentation of your Bible, you can write the Greek word doulos. D-O-U-L-O-U-S, doulos. Very important word. That word doulos. What it means in the original language is to be a bond servant. A bond servant or a bond slave. Paul used that word many times to describe his life to Jesus. I am a bond servant to Jesus. I'm a bond slave. Peter does the same thing. You see, that word bond servant is someone who serves, not because they have to, but because they want to. Not by force, but by freely giving of themselves to their master. You see, this is where it's important to learn, to study your Bible, to learn culture. Again, back in Hebrew culture, Jewish culture, being a servant to someone is like being a waiter at a restaurant. You weren't a slave to them, although they were called slaves. They were just servants, and they served. That was their occupation. They served their master. But here's what would happen over times of years, whether it's paying off debt or learning great getting an in- income. Over years of service, what happened is you became part of that family. They didn't look at you as just an employee. They looked at you as a, a son or a daughter. They looked at you as a, as a friend. And so over many years of service, eventually your time, your contract would end. And you were free to go. You can go do something else. But then you can also, you were free to stay. And if you stayed with that family and you became part of that family, you stopped being kind of a slave or servant. Now you became what was called a bond servant. You serve them because you want it to be there. By choice. And they would take a little wooden awl. And they would put it in your left ear. And everyone knew you were a bondservant by choice. Guys, if you're a follower of Jesus, I pray you would understand you follow Jesus because you are a bondservant to Jesus. Not me. You don't serve me. If you're a servant in this church, you're not serving me. You're serving the Lord. You're serving, as you serve the church, you serve the Lord. You're a bondservant to the Lord. In God's kingdom, we are called to be a servant, a doulos, serving the Lord and one another. I like how D.L. Moody put it. He said this, and I quote, The measure of a man is not measured by how many servants you have, but by how many men you yourself serve. That's the measurement in the kingdom of God. All believers in Christ, we are called to be a servant of the Lord. And the good news is this is that God uses plain and ordinary people for the ministry. God uses normal people. Are you normal? I hope. I think I'm a little strange. I have little quirks here and there. But God uses normal people. He uses anyone who is willing to yield and surrender to him. How many guys ever took the SATs? Yeah, I don't know what that is. (laughs) I never took that. Why? Because school was not my forte. I struggled in school. Uh, Math, I hate math. I'm not good at math. I'm I'm horrible at English. Ask Becky. Becky corrects everything I do. I send her stuff. She's like, oh, man. It all comes back like in a red felt pin. Thankfully, she doesn't put F at the top because that's what it would come back. Because I don't know the commas or the colons or the prepositions or I don't know. I just don't do that. I'm not good at that. I'm not, I, 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 I passed, I did well. I, I think I graduated high school with like a 3.0 average, right? And you think, well, Pastor Louie, that's pretty good. That's because I took public speaking people, okay? That's because I took art. I did good in art, right? All the other classes that raised my GPA. God uses normal people, not necessarily the people that get, what's a high score in SATs? 2,500? Different scale. What, what's, this, what's a good score? 1,500. 
Listen, if, if the good score is 1,500, I'd be like at 500. <laughs> That's where I would come. But God doesn't look at your SATs. He doesn't look at that. In ministry, in service, as a Christian, you don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the most educated. You don't have to be the most accomplished. You just have to be willing to give him your heart and your life. Now, I ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians. So turn with me. And we only got a few minutes left, guys, so we're going to wrap up. I'm going a little bit longer, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to see this. Because it really, it really amplifies the call of God on the church. Those that are in the church. Look at verse 26 down to verse 29 in your Bible. And I love this passage. Because this passage, man, I really believe was written just for me. What's he say in verse 26? You see, you see your calling, calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the those things which are mighty and the base things of the world which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I love this. God will call people that are smart. God call, will, he will call people some that are noble. When you think of a noble, what do you think? Someone of importance and, and value and proper speech and proper English and such and such, right? That kind of thing. That's not me. But God calls some of them, but not many. Why? Because there's very few people that reach that echelon of life or place. What I love here is that God will call anyone. He doesn't just look for the accomplished people. The people that are well-to-do. Listen, in our church, we have lawyers, we have doctors, we have nurses, we have people in professional fields, business owners, people that are successful, people that are well-to-do. We have those kind of people in our church. But when you look at the majority, that's not the majority. I love that God will use anyone who comes to him with a willing heart. In fact, I'll say this, if you're not familiar, there's probably no other verse in the Bible that truly describes the ministry of Calvary Chapel than this verse right here. Do you know my pastor, who has been a pastor for 50 plus years, that his whole life, up to the time that he received Christ, that he was simply a drug addict, a drug dealer, high on some type of acid, running through uh, Hawaii, just crazy on acid, and that's the guy that got saved and started this little church at Calvary Chapel Downey, at a park. Anybody want to come to a Bible study? He was a hippie. He looked weird. I'm sure he smelled weird. And people came to a park, Furman Park. I grew up at Furman Park. And he started doing a Bible study. And within a matter of just a couple years, that church grew to multiple thousands of people. He was uneducated and untrained. But his heart was for the Lord. And that church grew to be several thousand people just blew up. That's the story within, that makes Calvary Chapel what it is. God used the, the, the least, less likely people. They were saved, tra radically transformed, and then poured into them as they poured into others. Pastor Ed Taylor at Calvary Church in Aurora, same thing. The guy was messed up, drinking, got thrown in jail a couple times for DUIs, broken, got his girlfriend pregnant, got, and then got married, just messed up. And in 1991, he walked into Calvary Chapel Downey, sitting in the back because he was invited by a friend. That's why we invite people. And there he heard the gospel. And it was there that he was saved. And his life radically changed. We fast forward a decade later, he'd go, and I want to serve God. I want to see what God did with Pastor Jeff. I want that to happen in my life. He says, I'm going to move to Colorado and I'm going to serve Jesus. And he moves out here and God did an incredible work in his life and through his life. And then I come out here. Me, my testimony. Grew up in a Christian home. I never did drugs. And, and uh, you know, I was kind of squeaky clean. But God did a work in me because my heart was for sin. God protected me through my parents that were Christians God allowed me to go to Christian school, which I hated, but then I got saved. And I was like, if I'm going to do this, I'm all in. 
And at a young age, when I was 17 years old, God began to speak to me. And it's like, all I want to do is serve the Lord. I want to serve you. I want to, I want to serve you, God. Take my life. By the time I was 18, I was leading youth group and teaching and doing worship. By the time I was 19, Pastor Jeff said, hey, Louie, would you help and be the youth pastor, the junior high pastor, to take care of the junior high? Sure. Didn't know what I was doing. And then 10 years later, God calls me to Colorado. I help Pastor Ed. And then after 10 years, he's like, Louie, we, we need to go do something in Denver. Go do something in Denver. I don't know what I'm doing. I still don't know what I'm doing. But God does a work in those that are willing to yield their life. Again, God does not use pe perfect people. And you know why? Because there is no such thing. God uses flawed and broken people like you and like me. God today is not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. And God will work in you through your willing heart to serve him, to live for him. Again, another quote that I love, that I've, I've held dear to my heart, is this. God doesn't always call the qualified, but he always qualifies those whom he calls. And as God calls you to himself, he works in you and through your life to minister to others. Guys, biblical and spiritual leadership is ordained by God. And God today is actively looking for men and women who will say and raise the hand and say, Lord, here I am, use me. It's not the amount of Bible knowledge you have. It's not your past pedigree of application and all that you've accomplished. It's not about your referrals or references. It boils down to your heart to say, Lord, here I am, use me. Now, I was listening to a message Pastor Ed gave not too long ago, and he said something that left an, an, an impact on me that I've been thinking about for a long time. And he said this, and I quote, I have more years behind me than I have in front of me. And I thought, huh, I'm close to 50. I'm there shortly. And I'm not going to live another 50 years. And I began thinking about that and going, man, that's true. I, I feel young still, you know. I, I kind of act young, you know. I grew up surfing, skating. I was a youth pastor for a long time. What you see today, as much energy as you think I have, it, it was like 20 times when I was a youth pastor. I was crazy. I would do cartwheels on the stage, man. I was crazy. And I'd be doing all kinds of things. And so I don't have 50 years ahead of me. So most of my life is done with. And I only have a short time that's ahead of me. How will you spend that short time that you have ahead of your life? Servant leadership starts here. It's knowing that God uses ordinary people who are willing to live and serve for him and for the sake of others. So here's what I want you to do. Meditate on what was shared today. Pray on it. Ask God to speak into your life over this idea and thought of servant leadership. And then take action. The action can be you following the lead of your pastor in this church by writing down your testimony and sharing it with another Christian. Then writing down that testimony again and sharing it with a non-Christian. Take action. And what you'll find as you yield greater to the Lord, he'll use your life in a greater way. Amen.